Hey everyone, this is Path Metrics. Welcome to episode 24 of Mixing Loud with Clip to Zero. In this video, I'm going to be showing you some tips and tricks about managing width and depth. And we're going to be doing it with this song. Not really a song actually this is just the core nucleus idea for a drop something to build a song around this is something i actually got to in about 15 minutes of starting a new project specifically to do a, a kind of start to finish walkthrough of my clip to zero method and i've been wanting to put out this video for a long time about width and depth but uh, some of the earlier demos i've been using throughout this series weren't challenging enough problematic enough in the width arena and the depth arena to really demonstrate some of the things I want to show you today. So I had to wait till I finally made some kind of really wide, ethereal, hypnotic kind of mid-tempo song like you just heard. So I got to this point in, the, in doing some of the early start to finish footage. There's just a few basic sounds just to kind of find a good drop idea to build around. So it's not a full song by any means, but you can see it's already hitting negative 6.5 lefts. And I have to really stress for those of you that have never seen my stuff before, this is all in the mix. There is no mastering limiter on here. There's no mastering chain on this project. There's no compressors, right? This is my raw mix using techniques and tools that I talk about in my clip to zero methods. So that's a good excuse to point out that if you've never seen my stuff before and you're stumbling across this for the first time, I have an entire playlist called Mixing Loud with the clip to zero strategy where I explain this process and this idea and the techniques for doing it. We're up to episode 24 and the capstone pretty much will be the next video coming after this one, which will be my start to finish, like watching me do a whole project the clip to zero way and quickly highlighting the decisions and things I do in the clip to zero methodology, if you will. So negative 6.5 in the mix. And you'll see in a minute when I demo this against a bunch of my reference tracks, it's like right in the pocket. We'll slip right into a DJ set right now as it is, no mastering limiter, and I am not going over zero, right? So anyway, uh, let's get back to the main content. Oh, you know, first I should say that um, I need to make really clear that all the plugins I'm going to be showing you are things I paid for myself. I have no promotional relationship with any of these vendors. These are just great plugins that I rely on to make um, the CTZ method fast and easy for myself. Okay, so back to width and depth. The thing to understand is it's spreading sounds out in the stereo field and in the depth field can really help to make more sounds that are happening all at the same time be more distinctly audible from each other. And you can do it with less individual volume per sound, which means you're gonna have a lot less potential clipping when you're working in really loud genres. And so that's why this mix sounds so full and is hitting negative 6.5 lefts, but you're not hearing any clipping at all. Look at this waveform. There's tons of white space and no, this doesn't look like a squish sausage, right? Does this look like a sausage to you? Look at all this white space. Look at these clean waveforms. There's hardly any clipping except on certain little transients in a few spots, right? And I'm hitting negative 6.5 luffs, no mastering limiter. Okay, think about that. So spreading sounds out, putting every, making full use of that width field lets you you know, get everything into an audible range and a certain density. Whereas by contrast, if you stack every sound on top of each other in a small, narrow space, all up front on top of each other, they have to fight with each other a lot more. They're going to sum with each other a lot more. 
Uh, the peaks are going to get higher. You're going to have to clip it harder to squish it into a small dynamic range to get up into the same loudness range as everyone else in the genre you're working in. And it's just, you know, it's messy. So width is your friend and so is depth. And uh, I see a lot of YouTube videos talking about width, width, but I don't see many talking about depth. Depth is a little tricky and I'm definitely going to go into this for you in this video and show you some tricks for that. Um, what else can we say about this? Making the full use of width and depth can also really improve overall problems with masking because everything's spread out and listeners can focus on what they want to. It can clean up the mud zone because there's a lot less congestion sometimes in the mids in that mud zone area between you know, 200 to 400 hertz. Um, it can also help eliminate bad sounding rumble way down in the sub region and the bass region. Uh, if you if you let your sounds with any kind of bassy or subby component spread too wide into the sides, then you end up with this correlation that especially if things are collapsed to mono, uh, there's going to be a lot of phase interaction way down in the bottom end, and that's going to cause the volume to move up and down and little resonant peaks to roll back and forth through that area, and it causes this kind of rumble that just muddies up your sub, makes it fuzzier and a little bit weaker in some ways, and it just doesn't sound good, especially on a really big festival or club system. Uh, so there's lots and lots of benefits to managing your width really well. Now, I'm not going to talk about how to make width. There's plenty of YouTube videos out there talking about the Haas effect and, you know, making differences in your left and right stereo processing and this plugin and that plugin that magically gives you width. And there's plenty of, plenty of different ways to create width, including directly in, you know, the way you set up your synthesizer patches and presets and all the effects racks and stuff. But What's much harder and not talked about it nearly as often on YouTube is how to control width that's out of hand. And so this video is going to show you like what happens when the width goes way out of hand and starts creating all kinds of problems like I've been talking about. Uh, so, you know, that's an important thing to know, too, is width is very important and depth is very important, but it's not all roses and puppy dogs. If you have too much width, it's going to cause serious problems with mono compatibility, and it can be challenging to find that sweet spot where there's enough width for all of the benefits I've been talking about, but still staying mono compatible. And I, I've seen some arguments by some people that, you know, mono compatibility isn't that important. Like, I've seen some really arrogant stuff out there. Oh, I don't care if people are going to listen to my song on a subpar system. That's not my problem. That's their problem. I don't want to have to do things that hurt my, my nice, wide, lush mix just because some people listen on their phone or they listen through a Bluetooth brick or they listen on their laptop speakers that are only, you know, eight inches apart and two feet from your face. And so it may as well be mono and stuff like that. You know, there's, there's attitudes out there like that, and I just got to counsel you, don't fall for that. Mono compatibility is important for everyone across the board. I don't care what genre, pop, rock, jazz, club, festival, bass, music, it doesn't matter. Mono compatibility is important. People listen to your stuff on all kinds of really bad systems, right? And you don't want your mix sounding drastically different and weak and thin and strange, just because somebody's playing it back on their phone. You want people who, who you know, roll across your YouTube clip or whatever, or Spotify on their phone, and they, they show it to their friend using their phone, and they go, wow, check this out. And you want it to sound banging, even on a phone, okay? And you'd be surprised how many people use little single speaker Bluetooth bricks and, and other really subpar equipment. Um, and then even in the club space, even in the festival space, you never know what you're going to get when you walk into a club. A lot of them are wired in mono, fully, top to bottom. Some of them may have stereo arrays, but the stereo part is only the mids and highs, and the subs are still wired in mono, right? Because it just takes so much power <laughs> to, you know, to, to get a sub array going. So, 
you never know what you're going to run into. And even if you make dance music and, and big bass music bangers and stuff like that, you need to be mono compatible. And I'm going to be demonstrating for you, even in a club situation, how mono compatibility is really important. Okay, let's get on with it. Um, so here's what we're working with. Okay, uh, here's the full waveform after clipping and everything. Here's what the individual layers look like. The pink is pretty much my drums. You can see that the kicks and snares aren't clipping at all uh, or barely clipping on some of the transients, just a tiny bit. Uh, the midline sounds are all staying well within the range of clipping. There's maybe a tiny bit amount of clipping on some of these, but uh, very small overall. I've got one sub that happens just on the downbeat, and it's interacting with these kind of subby sounding uh, bass. This offbeat bass I'm using also has a subby component. So I've got two different sub textures that are interacting. Let's solo the drums, the sub, and all of the midline noises. And shh. Nope, not the midline noise, it's just the offbeat bass. And let's show you what those three sound like together. And as I pointed out in my last episode, I actually have this midline sound side chaining my other sub sounds so that they can play nicely together in the middle where they interact a little bit. And the total sum looks like this. There is some stuff getting clipped uh, on some of the kick transients and especially on this downbeat bass. But what you're seeing here is really high frequency stuff. I'm ducking the low frequency of that offbeat bass. So it looks bad, but it really doesn't sound bad at all if I were to turn off all the clippers. But we're not going to focus on the clippers or any of that. We're going to focus on the width of this thing. So we have a fair amount of width in this offbeat bass. makes a nice texture contrast against the downbeat sub. And then these other sounds, when we bring them in, they're all fairly wide sounding too. Here's that pluck sound. Here's uh, this little turnaround clicky saw that I've got happening at the end of every four beats. A little bit of uh, Basey low end in it, but it's mostly that high end gritty uh, rub. And then um, this is just that scream sound. And then finally the offbeat bass again by itself, which sounds deliciously wide and it really makes a nice contrast against the stuff that's happening in the center. So, you know, when you put it all together, it sounds good. And if we were to compare it with a bunch of reference tracks, I'll, I'll do really short blips of some of my favorite reference tracks in this genre. Hopefully YouTube won't ding me for this. And we'll look at the comparative spectrum. Um, and you can hear that we've got the same spectral balance, the same amount of depth and energy on all parts of the spectrum, same amount of punch, the same amount of heaviness. So let's just pop through it real quick.
Okay, so you can see the spectral balance is the same, energy is totally in the right spot, loudness is in the right spot, density is in the right spot. It's definitely something that could just slot right into a playlist and mix in and out of these other tracks just fine. So everything's great, right? It's wide, it's interesting, nice spectral balance, uh, except no, <laughs> not really. So here's the problem. We're going to uh, flip over to a simple, easy button that lets us turn everything to mono. And I want you to watch what happens when we mono check this mix. And yep, hear how things disappear. All right, so you're hearing that. You're hearing how a lot of sounds drop in their energy and intensity. Uh, some sounds get a little thinner and more hollow. Uh, let's see if we can solo those one at a time and let you hear what's really going on. Of course, the sub and the drums are all good. They're, they sound the same either way, but let's let you hear it. This is mono, not mono. Practically the same, despite having a little ambiance around that. Here's the sub, of course, not monoed. And of course, there's no difference there because it's a sub who, you know, you don't make a super wide sub. That's folly. Now let's listen to this pluck sound, not monoed. It's mostly audible, but it's changing quite a bit. It's not ideal, right? Here's that little click phase saw. Now monoed. So it loses a little bit of energy, not too bad. Let's try the uh, scream sound. Monoed. So you can hear this loses a lot of energy when we mono that out. And then finally the offbeat bass. And you can hear that really gets destroyed when we go to mono. So the total result is we end up with this when we go from full width to mono. That's just unacceptable. If you're letting your mixes go out like this, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> because a lot more people listen on mono systems than you think. So let's look specifically at that club question for a second before I start showing you how we fix these problems. All right, so this is not gonna sound the same for you as it does for me, because this is balanced against a very specific set of headphones made for this system. But it'll still show you enough of the potential problem. Okay, so we're gonna demo a few different rooms. It's okay if this sounds a little weird and phasey to you in general and a little weirdly reverby and reflective. That's just the nature of these uh, emulation systems. So don't expect this to sound pristine. This is mixed translation checking software. We're gonna start in these barefoot midfields and then I'm gonna switch to this Avantone cube just to show you that uh, uh, what's happening when you know, we go from stereo to mono in this kind of mix checking emulation. Ah. 
So hopefully you hear the problem, right? This is why a lot of mix engineers swear by Aventones and they'll have a single Aventone cube sitting on their desk because it forces everything into mono. It puts it right square in front of your face. It collapses everything into the mid-range. And you can really hear how out of balance certain elements will be on pretty much bad playback systems, right? Uh, this work mixing, double checking your mix on a, on a cube like this can be really helpful to just get the basic volume leveling right, all your fader leveling. Uh, but it can also show problems with the stereo field and mono compatibility like this. See, when we go to this cube, about all you hear anymore is the drums and the sub. Well, it takes away a lot of the subs. So what you end up hearing is just in the whole midfield range, you're just hearing the drums really loud, like way louder than anything else, and it's unbalanced, and that's not going to sound good. Like that offbeat bass just kind of dies, etc. All right, let's listen on a bigger set of far fields, these empires in this studio. Sounds okay. Not too bad, but you know, some of the instruments are lost and getting overwhelmed by the heavy sub woofers that are hiding in the back of this thing. Let's listen to the far fields in Mike Dean's studio, which also has a big, huge array of subwoofers all across the front of his desk down here. Not bad, especially if I compare it with some of the reference mixes you'll hear, they all feel roughly the same. Okay, so that's not so bad. But when we do the near fields, which are these uh, NS10s, these Yamaha NS10s, again, you're going to, it's stereo near fields, so it's not going to sound too bad. But let's check it out. Right, so the mix sounds good on a stereo system, even when it's collapsed down to the, the mid-range, which is what these are famous for. But, uh, you know, this one over here, the Sauvintone cube, is very bad. You just can't hear anything except the drums in that mix. And then finally, let's try a club. Um, so I'm going to show you how this mix sounds in this club emulation, which is a big reverberant club with a super heavy sub bass. And uh, I'm gonna compare it against some of the reference tracks just so you can hear how this sounds in the club against the reference tracks. Okay, so it doesn't sound too bad in the club, right? But again, this club is very stereo. It's got a stereo array. And if I mono this mix, you're going to hear kind of what happens in this club if I mono the mix. And that's going to sort of kind of emulate what happens if this club didn't have a full stereo array in it. So hear how so many of the sounds that are important to this just drop. Okay, so this is mono compatibility. It's important everywhere. Clubs, it's important in regular playback systems. It's just something you have to deal with. So let me do a simple little trick. You can't see what I just did, but I basically turned on a bunch of things that are controlling the width a little bit better. And let's hear what happens in this club now when I switch over to mono.
hear how that's much more the same? I mean, yeah, you're losing that sparkle fairy dust out in the, in the sides, but it's still all the instruments are there where they need to be. You're hearing the full mix more or less in the same balance as before. Um, and just to show you, again, I'm going to turn off the thing I did and let's try it again. Hear how it's night and day if I don't control what's happening with the whip. Right, one more time, I'm gonna do my trick. Now here's with width under control. All right, world of difference. Let's try it in all the other rooms real quick before we go back to no VSX and let you focus on what I'm actually doing. So here's in uh, Mike Dean's room. Sounds effectively the same, whether it's monoed or not, but, but it does have that wider sense of fairy dust when it's not monoed. See, and that's what you want. You want to enjoy the width as much as possible, but if you end up with your song being played back in a system that isn't monoed or you know is doing things to uh, cancel the stereo, you need it to still sound good. That's called translation. So here's in the Tesla. Sounds, sounds pretty much the same, right? Whether it's mono or not. And when I say the same, I mean you hear the width go away, but the balance is still there, the relative balance of all the instruments. Let's try it in the, uh, this small control room on these nice far fields. Same story. Now let's go do the acid test. We're going to start on the barefoot midfields here. Okay, not bad. Now let's try the Aventone. How do we do that? How do we suddenly make this wide, ultra wide mix sound? perfectly fine in all these different environments, even when, um, you know, we go fully mono. How do we do that? So let's turn off VSX, go back to just no VSX at all, and we'll start talking about this. First, I want you to hear the thing I'm turning on and off without going into mono. I just want you to hear a stereo with this set of corrections off and then stereo with this set of corrections on. And I want you to hear how there's not that much difference in the way the mix sounds to you. Okay, check it out. First, let's turn it off. Now on. On. Everything still sounds almost exactly as wide as before. In fact, it sounds a little cleaner, a little tighter. There's a little less mud in the mid-range. If you were listening closely and you have a good system, you can probably tell there's a little less kind of general rumble down in the sub-region. Maybe I'll focus on that in a minute, let you hear that. Um, but there's no difference really in stereo, full stereo, when I turn this kind of correction on and off. Okay. Now, again, let's do a little acid test. I've got the correction off and we're going to flip into mono for a second. See a lot of things drop away in mono. Now I'm going to turn the correction on and we'll do this again. 
the effect is much less pronounced, right? More of the good stuff stays, the balance, the general balance stays. So let's talk about what we're doing here. Uh, I'm gonna get rid of SciScope because it's not really germane to this. Let me show you what this mix sounded like after my first 15 minutes of setting up this project, right? I'm doing a start to finish. I'm showing you, showing you as I bring in each sound element one by one. And, choosing sounds and doing some very quick CTZ clipping of the sounds to get them balanced up into the framework of the kick and the snare and so on and so forth. And I'll have a different video later that's like the whole start to finish walkthrough. But, you know, I got to this place 15 minutes in and I said, this is sounding really good, but I know I can hear that there are big problems with the width being too wide. It's really interesting, but it's too wide. And also the um, kind of plucky ARP sound that I brought in was a little bit too much up front and in our face. First, I'm gonna turn off the depth fix for the plucky sound, and you're gonna hear it's a little more in your face now. Now, this is what you've been listening to. I'm gonna turn on my depth trick for the plucky sound. Now it's off. Now it's on. So it's subtle, but I'm I'm very gently pushing that pluck back a little bit. I'm not reducing its volume. I'm pushing it back. And there's a little bit of a difference there. Uh, let me show it to you since I'm here, but then I'll I'll come back and explain how I'm doing this later. You might say, okay, this pluck is too loud. It's too in our face. We've got too many elements that are kind of dry and up front, kind of pressed against the glass, and they're all competing with each other a little bit. And we want that pluck because it's the main melodic instrument, but it's a little too dry and up front, right? So one way you might fix that is you might say, well, it's just too loud. Let's just pull the fader down a little bit. Let's pull the fader down just a tinch. And so let me show you. I'm pulling the fader down by 3.3 decibels to, to drop it back into a less prominent spot in the overall leveling of these, these sounds. And it's not bad. And it's the first thing most of us would try, right? But this is what it sounds like. Not bad, right? It's a much better mix. It's not as in your face. Let me just turn this whole rack on and off. Right, it's just a very subtle three decibel volume change. And that's good enough for a lot of people. But it's also, if you listen close, it's, it's muting and softening that pluck a little bit. It's, it's, it's not letting it retain its edgy interest as much. Now, by contrast, what I'm going to do now is flip back and forth between using a special rack for depth, a special technique for pushing things into the background, I'm going to let you hear that versus just turning the volume down. And it's the same relative loudness either way, but you're going to hear that the edge, that the, the sharp edges of this sound stay a lot more present with this faraway rack. Check it out. So here's dry with just a volume bump downward.
So it's a little more present around the edges, and you hear it a little more present out in the sides. It's like if I just turn it down, I'm pulling it down both in the middle and in the sides. And it's just kind of getting a little duller, a little softer. But if I use this other technique here, it's staying kind of bright and pokey and present out in the sides, but it's pulling away a little bit backward, back from the rest of the, the things that are kind of up front and centered. And so I'm using depth to still maintain the energy and interest of that sound a little bit better than just straight up volume leveling, right? So we're going to circle back to this in a minute. I'm going to, um, I guess I'll just leave it on so we hear it in a more balanced position while we talk about the width control now. So what I've been doing when I was turning my special set of correction on and off is just, you'll see this plugin here called Space Control. And if I flick a little knob on my keyboard controller, this turns on. If I flick the knob, it turns off. And I've just got a global MIDI mapping to the same plugin on all four of these problematic tracks. They all have this Space Control. And if I flip the switch, it turns on across all four of them. And if I flip the switch, it turns off across all four of them. So clearly I'm using this plugin, and it is a plugin, uh, to manage the width elements in a way that had all those benefits I showed you earlier, where we still kept all the, the width, but it was very mono-compatible and a little bit cleaner in the mud region. And let me also show you how it's also a bit less rumbly in the low end. Uh, let's see. We're going to listen to the full spectrum here, and I'm going to toggle this thing on and off. You'll be able to see underneath here this thing turning on and off. So what I'm going to do is grab the mid-range, and then let's just hear everything from 4K all the way down to um, the subregion. Actually, let's go with the low mids. I'm going to start with the low meds at 800 hertz all the way down. Now I want you to listen to the real extreme low end. I'm going to be really quiet. Turn up your volume if you need to. I'll talk really softly when I come back so I don't blow your ears out. And what I'm going to do, watch down here as I turn this on and turn it off um, and kind of listen really to the low end and whether it sounds cloudy and a little rumbly to you or a little bit tighter when I turn this on. Okay, so this is off. This will be the slightly more cloudy, slightly more rumbly version. talking softly. All right. Could you hear how there's, it's very subtle, but it's just, it's another benefit of controlling the width. If you don't let a bunch of elements fight with each other and phase with each other because of the differences between the left and the right channel, that's what creates width, right? You're always hearing from other YouTube videos, although maybe they don't demo exactly why, like I'm doing here, but they'll say your low end should always be really mono or bad things happen and they they'll you know they'll won't necessarily go into detail about it but one of the things that making sure your low end is mono will do for you is it will keep phase cancellation between the differences in the left and the right channel your your ear is going to be really sensitive to that the lower in frequency you go 
And we're going to perceive that, that rubbing phase cancellation as a kind of rumble that just clouds the low end. It just makes it cloudy instead of defined and sharp, right? So you can hear it from the low mids here around 800 all the way down. You can just hear everything just, just gets a little more defined when you take care of the width and the low end. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that before we went too much farther. Let's go back to full spectrum. So let's talk about what's going on with space control now and exactly what I'm doing here. This is a, it's not one of the plugins I talked about early. It came out about midway through the me doing the CTZ series. And I'm not going to say it's a must buy because there are definitely plenty of other ways you can do what I'm about to show you. What's cool about space control I saw one video about it and I just ran out and bought it because for me, this is something I always struggle with cleaning up was getting, you know, putting in all the little bits and pieces and tools to try and control the width in a way that wasn't too destructive. I think every engineer struggles with that a little bit. And certainly, you know, as Luca was explaining the, the driving force behind this plugin and as Hardwell was explaining the driving force, it was to try and put all those different things we usually work with in one spot. And it's just, it's a brilliant implementation. So, I mean, if this is in your budget to think about a plugin like this, it'll certainly make your life easier. But everything I'm about to show you can be done with basic, basic tools. Because all we're doing here is we're playing with mid-side balance of things. We're throwing limiters on the side signal of things and so on and so forth. So, I'll just kind of briefly walk you through what's going on here. On the left-hand side is everything that makes something wider. And right now it's all neutral. I don't have any spread turned on. These dry wet sliders don't have any effect if there's no actual spread being done. I'm not changing the incoming mix gain of any of these um, bands in the spectrum. So this side is effectively neutral, even though you're seeing some things lit up over here. Uh, my goal isn't to make the sound wider. <laughs> my goal is to control the width of the sound, which is a little too much. So that's what the right-hand side of the plugin is about, is controlling the width. And it does it in two really, really, really simple ways. First of all, in the center here, you can see that there's these bands uh, at you know, I've got a band split at 1000 hertz, another band split at 200 hertz. And then for each band, there's a set of controls. And one of them is really basic. It's literally how wide are you letting that part of the spectrum be? 100% is like the, it's like this knob here in Ableton's utility or Bitwig's tool. See where I'm hovering around this width knob. This thing here is just the width knob in utility or tool or whatever the equivalent may be in your DAW. That's all it is. It's just here, so it's convenient to work with it here, right? But you could drop a tool on a track and do the same thing I'm about to show you. Now, it's width, but it's the width only between 200 hertz and down, because we've got a, a band splitting kind of section here. And again, every DAW has some way to do multi-band splitting. Multi-band FX3 is what you would use in Bitwig, right? Looks like this. And Ableton has something similar. It's how they do their multi-band dynamics and OTT. And you can separate everything out into low, mid, and high bands, right? So all you would do to emulate what you see here is use whatever your DAW's native multi-band splitter is and drag some sort of tool or utility device that has a width knob and put it in each band. And that's the exact same thing you're going to see me doing with these things here. Okay, you set your band splits to be something that makes sense. Typically 200 and below is a good way to control your low end for width. 200 to 1K is another really important band for width. And then, you know, everything above 1K is another important band. And I almost never mess with more than just those three bands. And I usually don't change it from these default values. Maybe I'll drag this 200 line up or down a little bit and find a sweet spot. But, you know, in this case, we'll just leave it right on 200 or really close to it. Okay. 
Um, so that's how you would duplicate everything I'm showing you in space control in your own DAW. Okay. I'm, I'm really trying to make it so you don't have to run out and buy this. Uh, it's a convenient tool. It's not a necessary tool. Now, what's happening here is a little bit more tricky. For every one of these bands, not only can you just control the straight width, but you can also um, slap on an actual limiter that's only limiting the side channel. Okay, so to pull this off in your DAW, you would need to first drop in a multi-band split device, and then inside each band, you'd have your, your let's do it in the lows here, right? You'd put in tool or utility if you're in Ableton. So that's now in the low channel. And then right after that, you would put in a limiter. Yes, a limiter. Like you could use a lightweight limiter like track limit, which is what I use for clipping a lot, but it's literally a limiter. Now the problem is this is going to limit the full mid and side of the low end. You don't want that. You want to limit only the sides of the low end. So we have to put this limiter inside of some other kind of splitter device. So we're going to bring in a mid side split device. And this does exactly what it says. Within, we're in the low band and we've got a volume control and now we're splitting just the low band into its mid channel and its side channel. And all we would do is drop the limiter inside the side channel. And now this limiter will only act on the side information. And then you control, you know, how much it limits inside the limiter itself with its, you know, input and threshold and all that. So this is, again, I'm giving you the whirlwind tour. Every DAW is different. Not every DAW is going to have these nice fancy splitter devices to, to help you set something like this up, but Ableton certainly does. And uh, this is how you would set it all up if you were trying to do it with your DAW. But I'm just going to show you the concept using this tool, okay? So the first thing you need to do, it really helps to have some sort of visual multiband correlometer. So my favorite multiband correlometer is in Flux. And I'll show you what this looks like. So that thing on the left-hand side, this area here, that's the multiband correlometer. And it's basically showing you how wide the sounds are all through the spectrum from 20 hertz up to 20 K hertz. Problem is flux is a pain to work with because it's a separate window entirely. It's not a plugin that runs inside your DAW. So you need at least two monitors to really use it. You just keep it on the other monitor all the time. And it makes it really awkward to use for um, YouTube videos because I'm always having to like bring it back out in front of the DAW window if I'm trying to show things on it. So we're not going to use Flux. We're going to use a, a different tool also made by the same people that make Track Limit, uh, DMG Audio. They have a tool called, what's it called? Track meter. Looks like this. It's a nice small window. It's got a lot of different types of meters. Let me just show it to you real quick. Spectrum analyzer. What I really like about this is that I can have it show me the mid channel, which is the red line, and the side channel, which is the blue line. And if you work with Spectrum Analyzer showing you mid and side at the same time long enough, you know how to recognize at a glance that you do not have, uh, that you've got correlation issues and monocompatibility issues. Like this is a very monocompatible signal because the side information, the blue line is lower than the mid line, which is this red line all the way across the top. Now, if I turn off my set of corrections for space control, you'll see that the blue line suddenly starts getting really close to the red line all the way through. Let me zero this out. See how the side information is now almost as loud as the mid information, especially in a few key areas. And this is where phasing and correlation happens. Any, any place the blue gets really close to the red or even shoots past the red, you're going to have phasing when you collapse to mono or in certain environments, like a big reverberant club. And this area here where they're really close together. So any place the lines are close together is going to phase like crazy. 
And you can see that at a glance with a tool like this. So that's pretty cool. Um, it has other meters in it, like an octave kind of spectrum analyzer. It's got a typical spectrograph. It's got a Lisa Ju. And again, if I turn my width correction off, you'll see how it's a lot more uncontrolled now. So, you know, when you see stuff way out here, oh, that's horrible correlation and phasing problems. Um, it's got a oscilloscope that's not bad, but it's no size scope, so I hardly ever use it. It's got a 3D spectrograph. So it's a pretty cool tool, right? Uh, it's got a phase meter, and this is what we're going to focus on because the phase meter has this kind of running graph of average correlation. And what I want to show you is with all the side correction off, So you can see that the correlation is mostly staying positive over here on this side of zero, but that's for the entire mix and the drums and everything else are contributing to that. Let me move this out of the way for a second. Just let's uh, highlight a few of the problem sounds like this plucky doink. Uh, this is what the, the width correction off. So you can see how the correlation is all around the center and a lot of it is going negative. That's why the sound phases when we drop it into mono. Let's go to the next sound. And again, you can see it's all focused around the center and a lot of it goes negative on this side of center. So that's why it tends to disappear when we go mono. All right, and then the offbeat bass is the worst offender. See how wide the correlation goes way to the left here? And that's why it disappears when we go into mono. Now, by contrast, let's turn our correction, all our space controls back on, and you're gonna see the correlation is suddenly positive no matter what. Check it out. And this is what you want, right? You, you probably have various tools in your arsenal. There's a lot of free tools out there that will show you this kind of correlation window and where the average correlation is sit, sitting. Eventually, you'll learn to recognize what it should look like on a polar phase meter like this or on a Lisa Drew meter. You can tell when things are getting too far uh, into uncorrelated territory. But find some metering tool you have that will show you something like something like this and this will give you your first where is it this will give you your first clue that something's wrong and you need to do something to fix the width right that's fine because we have our correction turned on this is not so fine Now there's another way to see this, and again, track meter has something kind of like what I showed you in flux. They call it the phase spectrum, and it's horizontal instead of vertical, but you'll see how it works really quick. So I'm going to freeze it there just so you can see it. So what you're seeing is the base region and subregion is way out of control. This is left, this is right. And the wider the signal is, the more it's potentially uncorrelated. As soon as it gets out past pretty much this line, 
and this line, it's just starting to be so far out to the sides that it's going to phase and become uncorrelated. And the subregion and base region, everything below about, certainly below 100 hertz, is really problematic with a lot of uh, sounds you're going to get straight out of serum or vital or any kind of synth, right? So you really have to often go do something to mono out, at the very least, the subregion. So this is where we get back to space control or using the tools I showed you and the kind of rack I showed you. Uh, again, I'm not limiting it. In this case, I pulled the width all the way into zero. So let's let's bring it out to 100% and show you what it looks like. It's going to look, you know, pretty much like this frozen picture I have here. All right, there's a lot of movement in the low end here. If I drag this into zero, now it's much more like a laser beam. There's still a little bit of random movement, but it's much less wide than if I just, you know, turn this whole thing off. See those huge swings in the low end? If I turn this back on. It's being much more stable through here. Now, here's where it gets tricky, and this is why a multiband correlometer is useful. You'll notice on this particular sound, I also pulled the crossover way down to just above the, the sub range. Like it's not up here at 200, it's down here around 77. Let's listen to it at 200, and then that'll help me illustrate what I'm about to say. Now I'm going to pull it down to around 70 again, just above the sub range. Can you hear the difference? One more time. And you can see the difference. See how there's a lot more action right here in the low, in the base region, just above the sub range? Right here. So this particular sound is one of my subby, bouncy groove sounds for the entire mix, right? If I thin it out too much, if I remove too much energy and stereo width too far up, it's going to sound a little thinner and not really contribute to that energy and groove of the track. Let me let, me let you hear it in context with everything else. So it's subtle, but you can feel that there's a little more warmth, a little more bottom end when I'm really judicious with how much of this I'm trying to mono control, right? So that's a decision you'll have to make is I recommend on sub ear sounds that are important or bassy sounds that are also playing a little bit of a sub role and they're giving you your fat and your meat. You may want to you know, work closer to 100 or, or even just above the sub range like I'm doing here. But for other mid-bass sounds that aren't do, playing an important role in your low end, you probably want to keep this up around 200. So that's a tip to be aware of. And you'll see on other sounds, this is sitting right up here around 200. So let me put this back here and let me explain what I'm doing with the other part of this. So I've fully pulled in the sub range to be as mono as I can make it with just, you know, a, a straight up width control. And then for the two other ranges, I'm leaving the width at 100%, but instead I'm slapping a limiter on the side channel, only the side channel. So that's what these are. Is it's just like, how much am I limiting the side channel? And you kind of see it with this dynamic little wiggling lump bar you'll see in these two regions. So see that flickering right here? That's the limiter reacting really fast with a really fast attack and release. And so, 
you know, you can experiment with limiters and limiting only the side channel. And the basic idea there is it's like, I want it to go wide, but if the side is going to go so far up here, I want to crush it back down with a limiter, but only in the sides. Don't affect the mid channel. And so you're going to see when I turn this on and off, you're going to see this area here go much higher or down and be limited to around here. Check it out. See how it's staying in this region mostly? Now if I turn it off, we've got more spikes going further down. See, it's a little thinner. It's a little less wide all through here. And that's because of these limiters. But again, you have to kind of set it by ear and do a mono test on and off as you're setting it to find that sweet spot where you're keeping just enough width that it still sounds wide. But when you mono it, you don't lose too much energy. And so the point is limiting the sideband very carefully in a, in a side of a multi-band split is a very key trick. And I don't see many people talk about that. And, uh, you know, Luca and Hardwell just built it right into this plugin. It's like, thank you. It's so much easier than building custom racks and trying to do it. Cause you can just twiddle these dials and look at these indicators. And they have a nice visual indicator where if you see red on the edges, it's going into correlation territory, bad correlation, negative correlation. And so you can set the limiter until the red barely appears. Check it out. See how there's almost no red, but if I turn this off, well, I guess I need to leave it on, but I need to turn the limiter off. See the red edge on that? But if I turn the limiters back on, there's no more red edge or it just briefly flickers now and then. So this is the entire trick. And it took me so long to work through all the bits and pieces. I used to just slap on some sort of mid side balance control and just bring the sides in, but that can really kill a sound. The trick is to use limiters on the side band only in a band split kind of way. And then your low end band you probably don't want to limit. You probably just want to bring it in really close to mono so that you get this kind of shape in a multiband correlometer. Now we can check it on and off by just turning the power on and off. Listen to the difference. See, it sounds pretty much the same in terms of width, but now watch what happens when I mono it on and off. And I can also mono it here. They give you a nice mono button right here, or you can solo just the side channel here. So I'll mono it this way. Right? Sounds almost exactly the same whether it's mono or not. Now, if I turn this off, I have to use this mono button. See, it's just night and day. Also, I'll point out that they have that same correlometer that I was showing you in this view. Right here, this correlometer down here, they have the same exact kind of little correlometer right here. So this shows you there's a problem when we bypass it. Let's go back over here for this. See how the correlation looks really strong, but if I turn it off, it's ping-ponging all over on both sides, right? So if you can, you know, if it's in your budget to pick up a tool like this, it's handy. <laughs> but again, you can just do it by building racks like I showed you. So this is all I did was I went through each one of my sounds and put a space control on it and played with, you know, bringing in the low end towards the center so that this line would get um, better. See, I left this one up at 200, 
a little bit of limiting, left the width alone, just let the limiters take care of any overshoots. So a little movement here can be okay, especially if it doesn't have any real low-end content. That's why this control isn't really doing much, because I filtered out most of the low-end in this, and it's just probably not even picking up the signal as correctly. Let's go on to the next one. Just show you what I did here. See, it's the same pattern every time. Use the width control, bring it into zero or close to zero and then use limiters on the higher bands. And then you want to adjust, it'll change the relative volume a little bit. So you need to use this output gain to push it up a little bit to, to match when you turn it on and off. Like, um, this sounds boring. Let's not, let's not listen to this sound. That's just that turnaround buzz. Let's look at this one. All right. So I left it a little bit wider because this is a high plucky doink and it, I'm already filtering out a lot of the sides. Oops, let's turn off those solo buttons. Okay. So here's what you have to do. When you control the width a lot, it's gonna drop the perceived volume a little bit. So you have to raise the output gain at the very end to kind of compensate. And you test it by just turning the plugin on and off and checking with your ears that it sounds pretty much the same. So off, on. See how it sounds the same? But I had to put a 2.5 dB boost on it after doing uh, the limiting and taking out some of the, the low end width, right? So that should be all. All I need to teach you about uh, managing width in an intelligent way, it's just, it's just night and day. So let's talk now about the far away rack because this one's fun. We're not gonna need any meters for this. I'm gonna show you the rack and we'll talk a little bit about what's different. We'll also solo this sound so you can hear it in isolation. So first, uh, the sound by itself. <laughs> with the far away rack on. Now, it sounds quieter a little bit, but it sounds different. It's not just quieter. Do you hear a little reverb in there? Just a tiny bit. And do you also hear how the spectral balance is just different somehow? See if you can listen to just the low end and the high end of this sound and see if you can hear the difference. It's very, very, very subtle. And that's the trick with playing with depth, to be subtle. So I'll tell you what you're hearing. You're hearing that there's a little bit less low end and a little bit less high end. And it feels like there's a little tiny, subtle, subtle amount of reverb on it with some pre-delay on the reverb. Listen for all those things I just said. Could you hear it? Hear how it feels a tiny bit more congested into the mid-range? And there's a little bit of a super subtle reverb kind of wash on it. Okay, so let's look at the actual rack itself. Take away all the suspense. This is something Ill Gates taught me, and it's it's just an amazing trick. This is pretty much a rack that, that Dylan showed me how to build. <laughs> and... Uh, Thank you, thank you so much. Um, what's happening here is my macro knob is, let's see where it's at, 42%. So I've got this macro knob that's you know hooked up to little 
knobs and graphs to control the the curvature of how quickly things are moving in and out. We won't get into that. The basic idea, you can do this manually in an EQ. I just built a fancy rack to do it. So it's doing two things as I move this number around. First of all, it's it's completely off. All of these devices are completely off when the button's all the way down at the bottom. And as soon as I turn it on, these two little uh, high pass and low pass filters start moving in towards each other, but notice where they're centered. They're centered right around one kilohertz, 900 hertz, one kilohertz, right around there. That's where they kind of start to overlap. So they're pulling in, they're reducing the high end, they're reducing the low end, and they're kind of congesting towards the middle. Now at the same time, look at what's happening over here in this reverb. The depth of the feedback, the, the, the size of the room, the timing is getting longer with this knob here in the center. You'll see this little blue line go up. And the mix is getting stronger. Like when the knob's down here, it's very dry and you barely hear any reverb. It's a short reverb length and a very tiny mix. And as I keep pushing this up, and as these side elements are coming in, the HPF and LPF, the mix is increasing and the depth is increasing. And I'm using a room reverb, not a big hall, just a little room and a little bit of pre-delay and not too much feedback and diffusion and buildup and all that stuff. And every reverb's different, so good luck, right? But the basic idea is make it a little bit bigger and deeper sounding of a room and bring up the mix and make sure you're using a tiny bit of pre-delay, okay? And this is how we em emulate psychoacoustically the position of an object in space in a room. And so we're pushing it far away. So now if I get really extreme at the rack, you're gonna hear how it pushes the sound far away from you. Right around 40%, it starts becoming really apparent. Right? It's very subtle all the way through about the 50% range, and then you start really hearing it right about here. And so this is usually the sweet spot when I'm working with a rack like this. And you can see how the mix is up to, you know, about 50% dry, 50% wet, and, you know, the depth of the reverb has gotten deeper. And then another small nuance is on the wet output of the reverb. It can help to shape the EQ of the wet output to be kind of in this region um, up here. So you can just kind of look at the spectrometer and you probably want a big dip right around 1K here. And you want to emphasize this little part and this little part of the, uh, the reverb wash. Okay, so um, that's the trick in a nutshell. Now, whether you build a fancy rack to do this, depends on your DAW. Um, it's, oops, what did I just do? It's easier in Ableton. It's certainly easy in Bitwig. I can't speak for every other DAW, but building a rack like this is certainly helpful. And if necessary, you can just do it all manually with a, an EQ and a reverb and just kind of play with high pass and low pass and depth and mix, and you'll be able to control the depth. So here, I want you to hear it in context now. Uh, this is completely dry. <laughs> So here's a very subtle amount. You're just starting to notice it. I'm going to toggle it on and off so you can hear it on and off. Here's off. Right? Subtle. Don't overdo it. Now, let's hear it in context, on and off. And 
And again, notice how it sounds better than just doing it with pure volume, which is what the tool is doing. It's just dropping the volume by three decibels, but it's not playing with the spectrum. It's not playing with the reverb. So we're just going to go back and forth between far away and the tool. Okay, so thank you very much for hanging with me for an hour. <laughs> I hope you learned something. This is pretty intermediate, advanced stuff. Wrap your head around these principles, apply this to your own music, and you'll have uh, a much easier time getting into the really loud ranges without a lot of muddiness and rumble and lack of clarity and instruments fighting with each other. Instead of trying to have everything fight in the center, spread your sounds out in the stereo field. And if you have a whole bunch of sounds that are all competing for attention up front, push some of them back a little bit. Push one further back. Push another one just a little ways back. And just, you know, play with the psychoacoustic space of your mix. Spread things around and you'll find you can actually get everything louder because you're spreading the energy out into the sides and you're spreading the energy out in time. That's why we use reverb as well as a spectral HPF and LPF moving in towards each other. We use that reverb to also kind of create this separation in time and timing between the attacks of that pluck and the attacks of everything else that's happening at the same time, right? Separated in time, separated in depth, separated in width. All those are very important elements for your mix. It's, mix. it's very subtle. It takes a lot of practice, but, you know, keep coming back to this video, uh, checking out these techniques, giving it a try. And thanks for hanging with me. I'll see you next time.